In a world fraught with danger and adventure, the current era has been swept up by the turmoil of war. Whether clashing over land, religion, or more nefarious agendas, the factions of the Iron Kingdom struggle for ultimate supremacy. High Command is a deck-building game in which you take on the role of a military strategist directing your nation's martial forces in various theaters of war. You must purchase and deploy your armies in an effort to gain the most victory points by the end of the game. The primary way to earn victory points is by capturing location cards. Victory points can also be earned by purchasing certain cards from your reserves and adding them to your army deck. To set up for a game of high command, start by shuffling the location cards together. Then, draw a number of locations from the location deck equal to the number of players and place those locations face up in a row in the center of the table. These represent the current locations over which players will be fighting for control. Each location card represents a specific region within the Iron Kingdoms. The ability box lists any special rules the card follows. The victory point value of each location helps determine which player wins the game. Resource icons indicate the quantity of command or war a player gains when he discards the location as a resource. Next, set up the Winds of War deck by shuffling each of the three card types, late, mid, and early, into separate decks. Place the late war cards face down on the table first, and then the mid war cards face down on top of them. Finally, place the early war cards face down on top of that stack to create the complete Winds of War deck. Winds of War cards represent various events that occur during the season of campaigning, with a new Winds of War card drawn at the start of each round. The Winds of War deck is also the most common way the game ends. When the Day of Reckoning card is revealed, the game is over and final victory point totals are counted. Once the Winds of War deck is complete, each player selects a faction to play with during the game. In this game, DC chooses to play Signar, I choose Crix, Tony chooses Circle Oberos, and Ed chooses to play Scorn. All faction cards have at least one listed card type. Many card abilities affect other cards by using the term for one or more card types, such as Bane or Undead. Army cards in High Command have several other important elements that players will reference during play. The power icon shows how much damage the card deals when it battles at its location. The health icon shows how much damage an opponent must deal to this card to destroy it. The card's detachment color indicates the detachment it belongs to. The ability box lists any special rules the card follows. Be sure to read card abilities carefully because they vary greatly. The card's purchase box shows the resources a player must discard in order to add the card to his discard pile from his reserves or to deploy the card from his hand to one of the locations. The card's rush box shows the resources a player must discard in order to add the card directly to one of the locations. Some army cards are worth victory points and adding them to your army deck increases your chances of victory. Note that many army cards are not worth victory points and do not show an icon on the card, and even the army cards with the most victory points still aren't as valuable as the least valuable location. Resource icons show the quantity of command or war a player gains when he discards the card as a resource. Note that some cards can be discarded only for one of the two resource types, and some cards cannot be discarded for resources at all. Combine and shuffle all the basic resource cards. These cards are the starting cards for your army deck. Place your army deck face down on your right. Choose three of your faction warcaster or warlock cards. Your choice of warcasters or warlocks directly affects the detachment choices you have when creating your reinforcement deck. For each warcaster or warlock, choose one set of detachment cards that matches one of the detachment colors listed on that warcaster or warlock's card. Combine and shuffle these three detachments to make up your reinforcement deck for the game and set it face down to your left. Then place the top four cards of the reinforcement deck face up in a row to its right. This new row of four cards is called your reserves. Place your three warcaster or warlock cards face up on your far left and return all other faction cards to the box. For this game I will be taking on the role of the first player. Each player draws six cards from his army deck and the first round begins. At the start of each game round, the first player draws one card from the Winds of War deck, reads the effect aloud, and then discards the card face up into the Winds of War discard pile. The effect of this card remains active until the start of the next game round when a new Winds of War card is drawn. After resolving the Winds of War card, each player, starting with the first player, takes a turn consisting of three steps, 
the capture step, the order step, and the battle step. The first step of my turn is the capture step, but at the beginning of this game I have no cards at any locations and so they cannot be captured. Once I have purchased and deployed forces during the order step, I will be able to capture locations during the capture step on future turns. During the order step of your turn, you discard cards for resources used to purchase, deploy, or rush cards. The first resource type is Command. This is primarily used to purchase, rush, or deploy warrior cards. The other resource type is War, primarily used to purchase, rush, or deploy Warjack and Warbeast cards. When purchasing, rushing, or deploying cards, a player can discard each card in his hand for the Command or War value shown on the card. A card can be discarded for only one of the two resource types. Note that cards do not need to have the resource card type in order to be discarded for resources. Nearly any card can be discarded for minor resource gains. After you choose to purchase, rush, or deploy a given card, you discard cards until you have discarded resources equal to the cost of performing that action. You can overpay, but any leftover resources are lost. This being my first turn, my primary goal is to start adding troops and warjacks to my army deck for later rounds. Therefore, I begin my order step by purchasing Banethrall Cadre, discarding two Raise Dead and one Lich's Command to pay the Banethrall Cadre's purchase cost of five Command. I place the purchased card in my discard pile and then immediately draw a new card from my reinforcement deck, placing it in the now empty slot in my reserves. I then discard two Necrotite Rig cards for four War to purchase the Desecrator. With only a single Necrotite Rig left, I cannot purchase any more cards from my reserves. Typically, you will use most or all of the cards from your hand to purchase, deploy, or rush cards. But, if you have cards left over at the end of the order step, or if you want to save a powerful card for a later turn, you can bank one card by placing it face down in front of you. Any other cards, however, must be discarded. After banking and discarding, I draw six cards from my army deck to create a new hand. Note, however, that six cards is not the maximum hand size. Some abilities or effects, like banking a card, enable you to have more than six cards in a single turn. When you need to draw cards and your army deck has run out, you can select up to one card from your discard pile and move it to your Occupying Forces pile, effectively removing that card from the game in order to fine-tune your deck. Then shuffle your discard pile to make a new army deck and finish drawing cards as normal. Now that we've seen how you purchase cards from your reserves to build your army deck, Let's move ahead a few rounds to see how you begin using those cards to fight for domination over the location cards. To deploy a card, you choose a card from your hand, pay its purchase cost and resources, and then place it beside one of the locations on the table. This round, I decide to deploy my Desecrator to Fort Falk in order to stop DC from capturing it on his next turn. In order to deploy the Desecrator, I need to pay the Desecrator's purchase cost of 4 war. Two Necrotite Mining Rig cards provide the war I need to get my Warjack onto the front lines. In addition to being purchased and deployed normally, Army cards in High Command can also be deployed directly to a location from the reserves. This is known as a Rush. To rush a card, you choose an Army card from your reserves, pay its Rush cost and resources, and then play it directly to one of the locations on the table. After rushing a card, you draw a new card from your Reinforcement deck and place it in your reserves just like when you purchase a card. Note that you cannot rush cards during the first two rounds of the game. In addition to choosing to rush a card from the reserves, you can also rush one or more Warcaster or Warlock cards during your turn. This works exactly like rushing other cards, except that Warcaster and Warlock cards can only be used once and are discarded to the Occupying Forces pile once used, so use them wisely. With my Warjack committed, I decide to go for DC's throat and hopefully steal Fort Falk right out from under his swan beak. Since I don't have the resources to rush a card from my reserves or deploy the Banethrall Cadre from my hand, I decide to unleash Gorshade the Bastard by discarding my last Necrotite Mining Rig to pay Gorshade's two war rush cost. Warcaster and Warlock cards are the most powerful cards a player can use in an attack. They do not have health stats and they cannot be destroyed, but they only stay in play for a single attack. A Warcaster or Warlock is mobilized by paying its rush cost listed on the card and is then immediately deployed to a location. During the turn it is brought into play, its power will contribute to the attack at its location, and its ability will enhance friendly cards, hinder enemy cards, or provide more specialized effects such as allowing you to make a second attack at its location. At the end of the battle step, a Warcaster or Warlock's abilities end, and you place it in your Occupying Forces pile. I place Gorshade the Bastard at Fort Falk. 
In addition to adding his formidable strength to the upcoming fight, Gorshade's ability Dark Summons allows me to deploy or purchase one Bane card this turn without paying its cost. With an evil chuckle, I take the Bane Thrall Cadre card from my hand and deploy it for free to Fort Falk as well. Suddenly, the situation just went from bad to worse for the Signaran defenders. During the order step, if you have numerous cards in the reserves that require a specific resource and the opposite type of resources in hand, a good option is to refresh the cards in your reserves. To refresh a card, you must first discard a card, then place a card from your reserves on the bottom of your reinforcement deck, and place the top card of your reinforcement deck in the open spot in your reserves. You can refresh cards in your reserves as many times as you like as long as you can pay the cost of discarding a card each time. During your turn's battle step, you attack at each location that contains other players' cards and one or more of your own cards. When attacking at multiple locations, the attacks can be resolved in any order. To perform an attack at a location where only one opponent has cards, first check if any of the cards at that location have zero health due to card abilities. If so, discard those cards immediately. Then, each player adds up the total power of all of his cards at that location. DC's Signar Army has a total power of 4, while my Crix Army has a total power of 9 thanks to Gorshade's Battlegroup Commander ability that gives all Warjacks at his location plus 1 power. Each player can then declare what enemy cards to destroy at that location with a total combined health equal to or less than his total power at that location. I choose to use my total power of 9 to destroy the Ironclad and the Trencher Platoon. Though DC's total power of 4 is enough to destroy the Bane Thrall Cadre, their stealth ability prevents them from being destroyed until all other friendly cards without stealth at their location are destroyed. Unfortunately for DC, this means he cannot destroy any of my forces in return. However, DC does strike a parting blow thanks to his Ironclad's knockdown ability, which requires the player who destroyed it to discard a card from his hand. Still, an acceptable price to pay for ousting the forces of Signar from Fort Falk. After combat, all players simultaneously place their destroyed cards in their discard piles. To perform an attack in a location with multiple opponents, first choose if the attack is a targeted attack or an all-out attack. For a targeted attack, choose one opponent and resolve the attack exactly as if it were an attack against a single opponent. During a targeted attack, only the active player and the targeted player's cards can destroy enemy cards, and only those cards can be destroyed. Things work a little differently for an all-out attack. It's Ed's turn and he has his eyes set on wiping out all opposition from five fingers. During his battle step, he declares an all-out attack at five fingers. At the start of the attack, no cards have zero health, so none are discarded. Ed's Scorn Army has a total power of six, DC's Signar Army has a total power of four, and my single Death Ripper has a power of one. Next, all of Ed's opponents add their total power at that location together. DC's Signar and my Cricks have a combined power of five. Ed uses his total power of 6 to destroy both DC's Minuteman and my Death Ripper. In an all-out attack, only the player to Ed's left can destroy opposing cards at that location, but he uses the combined power of all opponent's cards. DC and I have a combined power of 5, and DC being the first player to Ed's left, chooses to use our combined power to destroy Ed's Cataphracts at Trotty. Once a player's battle step is complete, the next player's turn begins. Once each player has taken a turn, the first player draws and resolves the next Winds of War card effect to kick off a new round. Several rounds have passed and troops have been deployed to various locations. As my turn begins, it's time to see if I will be able to claim any locations this turn during my capture step. During your capture step, if you have at least two more army cards than any other player at a single location, you take that location card and add it to the discard pile of your army deck. Gaining the location card earns you valuable victory points as well as the resources listed on the location card to use in future turns. At the start of my turn, I have four cards at Fort Falk where DC has two cards and Tony has one. Since I have at least two more cards at the location than any other player, I capture the location and add it to my discard pile. If DC had three cards instead of two, I would not have more than two cards than any other player and would not have been able to capture the location. Some location cards have an ability that triggers when you capture that location. If a location has a when you capture this location rule, you must follow that rule before adding the location card to your discard pile. In addition, when you capture a location, you must move your cards at that location to your occupying forces pile. Cards in a player's occupying forces pile still count towards his victory points, but no longer fight to take new locations. Other players who had cards at that location place those cards in their discard piles. 
At the end of the capture step, replace each captured location with the top card of the location deck so that the number of locations in the middle of the table always equals the number of players. If you cannot do so, the game immediately ends. There are two ways a game of high command can end. The most common way for the game to end is when the Day of Reckoning card is revealed during the Winds of War step. Alternatively, the game ends as soon as there are no locations remaining in the location deck, and there are fewer locations remaining on the table than there are players in the game. Once the game ends, each player adds up the number of victory points in his army deck, discard pile, and occupying forces pile. The player with the most victory points wins the game. In the case of a tie, the player who captured the most location cards wins the game. It's been a hard-fought game, but no campaign season, no matter how brutal, can last forever. With the reveal of the Day of Reckoning Winds of War card, it is time for Ed, Tony, DC, and me to total up our victory points. After adding the victory points in each faction's combined pile, DC has 19 victory points, Ed has 14, Tony has 20, and I have 18. With the most points, Tony wins this campaign, but the war is far from over.